Welcome back to Muscle Minds with Dr. Scott Stevenson. I'm Scott McNally. This program is brought to you by truenutrition.com. You could use our codes. We have the code ADVICES and you could get uh, their oatmeal blends with the code ADVICES OATS for 25% off. We've been running a contest for that. People have been uh, promoting the new Think Big Bodybuilding Media page uh, by making a post about it and uh, linking their followers to Think Big. And uh, if you do that and you tag me in it, you are entered in the contest to win a one pound bag. I've got several of them of the True Nutrition Oatmeal Blends. Um, I've got a, I got a couple winners that I've already picked on hand and I've got a couple more that uh, that are still to be picked. What is up? Good morning, Dr. Scott. Oh, one more thing. Guys, if you have anything else you want to post about the show, feel free to post on this thread here. Uh, we may be able to take some questions or some follow-up stuff you know, as we go. So uh, feel free to post in the thread as we record live. And the final version will be over there at Think Big for the video. The audio version, of course, will be at advicesradio.com, iTunes, everywhere else that Advices Radio can be found. All right, with all that big mouthful, Dr. Scott, what's up, man? You're looking kind of tan. Uh, well, actually, you son of a bitch. You got to go right there. It's not tan. It's, it's pro, what's well, actually, it's a little bit of protein and a lot of, um, uh, liquid sun rays, which works so much better for me. I hate to say it, but really something I've learned. Yeah. Before I forget though, yeah, I have, I was looking around. I have this. What's that? It's a uh, powdered peanut butter, like oh. low fat powdered peanut butter. Mm. I, I, I like the, there's a, actually a powdered almond butter. And I was thinking about the true nutrition oatmeal. Yeah. You don't want to go like this is obviously not uh, animal based, and right. oats are not animal based protein. So you might want to throw a little whey in there. But if you could get like maybe like a ch little chocolate whey to enrich with uh, essential amino acids, but this would be probably really friggin' good. Like this is the chocolate. They have vanilla, a bunch of flavors. Um, add that. Add that to the oatmeal. Get a little extra protein in there. Might be really freaking good. That could be good. Anyway, they yeah. Could, anyway, they do have. Uh, out. They've got peanut butter flavor too. Uh, I believe. Oh, yeah. In some of the some of the oatmeal blends already, so I wouldn't be surprised if they're using like a powdered peanut butter to flavor that or something like that. You know. I you know I think it's probably just the flavoring. Otherwise, mm, okay. they would be advertising that it's got extra protein. Like this is oh like this is it's five grams of protein and like five grams of carbs. Per oh serving. damn, that's great. Only yeah, it's yeah five carb. Um, one gram of a dietary fiber of that and one gram of fat. So it's pretty 10 out of 50 calories from fat and five protein, five grams of carbs. Okay. Nice. So, so this is a pretty low fat, you know, decent protein source. Hmm. But, but I, I throw this people have maybe seen, I've done some Instagram stories where I've made protein pancakes Yeah. and then I've taken honey or lately I've been using maple syrup. Mm. So it was a little bit higher glycemic index. Honey's got an advantage. It's advantages. It has some natural antioxidants. Yeah, which may actually help with recovery. Believe it or not, muscle I didn't recovery. Know that. Okay. Yeah, there's a little bit of research, but um, and I throw this on and then, like mix it in with the maple syrup and get kind of like a chocolate almond butter, um, sort of a sludge that's just delicious. I haven't seen uh, that brand pancakes. before. What, what, where do you pick that Pe up at? Peanut butter and company. This is Mighty Nut. I think I may have gotten this on Amazon. I may have gotten it in the. Um, in the grocery store i can't recall okay. I, okay I have an almond butter one i was cleaning up yesterday i think i put that up but it's back in the back of that in the back of the kitchen i discovered but, a delicious kombucha scott this i brought back <laughs> this from uh uh what do you call it um uh, ontario it's a brand called organic oh. kombucha booch this is uh established in 2014 citrus mist this is my jam man it's a, a delicious delicious kombucha um I I smuggled it back over the border. It? No, did you have to claim it? I smuggled or? it. I smuggled it in a boat over the border. A crate of it. No, no, just sure. just the one bottle. I didn't have to claim yeah. it. You know, I, I, related funny story, which I've now found a solution to. But um, so when you're dieting down, like Diet Orange Crush mm. is like awesome, and Grapeco was the name of a diet grape soda. Okay, only made in the South. Okay, it's like kind of a Southern thing. Yeah, like, I never heard of it. Uh, yeah, I don't think I, I never had either whatsoever. And I found it. I was dating a woman who lived in Albany, Georgia, and I found it in the grocery store. And I was actually dieting down at the time. And I'm like, oh my god, this stuff is awesome. And it's diet. It's diet. Yeah, and it's called Grapeco. And I, huh. you couldn't find diet grape soda anywhere. Huh. Well, now I actually this. Um, where is it at? Right here. This is actually Soda Stream caffeinated. Wow. 
water, and this isn't this is like a berry, but I have I have uh, grape flavoring. There's actually almost every grape flavoring is the same grape flavor as you get in that grape of soda. <laughs> no kidding. Which I, which I figured out. You can just put it in seltzer water if you want to, or soda water. But yeah. So anyway, that grape pico. I found that, and I couldn't find it anywhere, and I you know, couldn't find it in Florida. It was only like in like certain like small regions, and there was, it was in every grocery store in Albany. So I literally contacted the company. I was going to have them send it to me. It was going to be exorbitant prices. Yeah. Like just like twice as it's just as much in shipping as I was paying for the actual soda. So when I would go up there, I would load up there. I would load up my, I would load up like twenty, twenty two liters of grape to go soda. Oh my gosh! Home, and my the whole top of my fridge was covered with grape diet soda. Oh my gosh! Point time. But, but no, no more. No more now because you have to. this machine. I have the soda. The soda stream is awesome. I bet you know. I, go, ahead. go ahead. I was gonna say I just got turned on to him. Victoria's dad has one. And I freaking love it. But I got to ask you, though, is, is is there any negative issues to the carbonation, to, to consuming these the CO2? Okay. I mean, your body, you're exhaling CO2 all the time. Okay. <laughs> only one I can imagine. I mean, like, so sometimes, like, like infants will have problems. Like, kids will get, what's the term? There's a certain term for this where... Where babies like they'll get some tooth decay because they're just like you get they're given candy and sweets and it just sort of stays in their mouth. Oh yeah, you know, kind of gives them some some cavities. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you were to like just like leave uh, you know carbonated water on your low teeth, pH, like on your teeth, like didn't swallow it, like yeah. that would maybe cause an issue. But otherwise, I don't. Not that I know of, none. Hmm. It's, it's carbon dioxide, which is you know inert. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Totally unrelated. Uh, well, not too unrelated, I guess. Talking about uh, you know what we're sorry, consuming. Sorry, carbon dioxide. What, what carbon did you say? Monoxide. You said carbon, carbon monoxide. monoxide. <laughs> yeah. No. Hello, Brainerd. Um, like, what? Yes. I was talking to Ken Kanekin the other day. He said there. So from what he was saying, the um, the. Uh, uh, the I what is it, what is that called that machine? There's a particular machine. Evan Santapani was using it, and he was using it to change the pH of his water. And it, it oh, was it was like a know, whole like, system on his on his countertop, and you could <sighs> dial the numbers in, and it was real fancy. But they were saying that that machine isn't really it's not making a big difference. But the, the but their people were finding benefits from it, and he was saying the thing that they're into now is they're saying that it has to do with uh, with adding hydrogen. That there's something because of this that inc- it increases the hydrogen in your body, and that that has to do with improved recovery. I'm not sure exactly what it was. I got to talk to him more about that. I'll have to see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, if if you if if you change the pH of of the water to make it more basic or acidic, to the extent that it would literally alter your body's or your blood pH um, substantially for any prolonged period of time. Then you would do damage to the epithelial cells of your of your mouth and oh. your esophagus, getting it down. Oh, okay. Um, it would just be so basic; it would be caustic, um, or it would be destructive. I mean, that's typically technically not caustic. That's what acidic is, but it would not be good. Okay. So your your body, like you've got so many buffering mechanisms in your body that, um, and so much water in your body. That you know, you take an eight ounce glass of water, and like you can just like you could go and do the basic chemistry and figure out. So you take, let's say, I'm going to just do the rough numbers here. Let's say um, your body, the fat free mass of your body is, I think, seventy two point eight or seventy three percent water. Okay. So that's almost three quarters of the fat free mass. So let's let's say your body's two thirds water, something like that. So if you're if you're an, uh, an 80 kilo, let's say you're a, you're a big bodybuilder, you're a 100 kilo bodybuilder. So that's that's basically, so you've got 60, let's say 70 liters of water in you. Yeah. Pretty long. And so you're going to take a half a liter of water that has somewhat, is, has some pH in it that's, let's say it's it's now it's 9 or 10. I don't know what they're claiming that, that it actually is. And you're going to add that, so a half a liter to 70 liters and just i mean this isn't the, this isn't the actual how you do the chemical i don't even actually know how you do the calculations i have to look back to my basic chemistry yes um but you're not gonna you're not gonna magically shift the ph substantially even if, if there was nothing in the body 
to keep pH in balance. Yeah. If, there, if there's a bicarbonate buffering system, which especially during exercise is super important, and that's basically that's actually exhaling carbon dioxide. Yeah. What does that? And I could I could draw the equations for that. But when you have hydrogen ions that are produced, those are combined with bicarbonate. <clears throat> um, you get carbonic acid, and then you get in carbon dioxide freely dissociates from that. So you, if you exhale carbon dioxide, um, you run the reaction such that you consume protons. So you reduce you reduce acidity, you raise pH the more you exhale carbon dioxide. That's one of the reasons why we have to um, ventilate more during exercise. And any of the exercise science people out there know all about the lactate threshold or the ventilatory threshold. You'll have people start to exercise, and, and there's some comp- there's a pretty complicated physiology going on in here, but it's sort of the standard way people think about it. You start to increase exercise intensity and you'll have a one you'll have a linear relationship between your ventilation and your oxygen consumption and um, your CO two production. And then at some point you reach a lactate threshold. Okay. Or ventilatory threshold. And if you try to go harder during during this exercise, you get you get a, an increase in the in the slope of that relationship such that you're producing excess CO two. Okay. And that's because of of an increased acidity that's coming from lactic acid metabolism. It's called the lactic lactate threshold. Okay. Um, it's called the ventilatory threshold because you see a divergence from that linearity of ventilation versus the CO two. So you're actually technically hyperventilating. You're ventilating more than what your body needs to ventilate mm. in order to um, meet the needs for oxygen consumption. Yeah. The excess breathing, the ventilation, bringing air in and out, is to get rid of CO2 so that you can bring the pH, or you don't actually completely accommodate, but the idea is to at least temper the reduction of the pH, to temper the acidity that happens in the body when you go at higher higher um, intensities. And that's why, like, when you train with weights, you produce a lot of lactic acid. That's part of which, what gives you the sensation of the burn and the pain in the muscle. To change in pH. Hmm. So you've got that. You've got hemoglobin is a major buffer in the body. There's intracellular buffers as well. So the cells are buffering themselves. Hmm. If you start changing the pH in cells or in the body substantially, you change the shape of all the proteins. And that's basically the, that's the operating machinery of the body are enzymes, receptors, hormones, proteins that are mediating all the chemical reactions and um, the the basically how our nerves work, how our muscles work, how all of our organs work is based on proteins conforming to a specific shape, hmm. so that they can interact with one another according to the kind of lock and key mechanism that you see used to describe how hormones work and how enzymes work, etc. So you start fucking with pH, you basically just everything goes to shit, really hmm. in a major way. So our body is going to protect blood pH really really um strongly really really powerfully defend ph and body ph if you mess with like the ph in your cerebral spinal fluid that's a bad bad thing i could imagine yeah so that's very very important too and that's a special filtrate of the blood's plasma so anyway the idea that you could take like let's say a liter of of water that's at an elevated ph and substantially raise your body's ph um just, I've never seen anyone d- demonstrate that in any way, shape, or form. Like, all you have to do is you just take the me- measurements, you know. Or, or you could actually, you could probably see it in, in, in the accommodate. You could see it. If you could substantially do that, yeah, you would see, like, someone could drink, like, a, slam a liter of the high CO2 water, and you would see a change in the carbon dioxide production hmm. in the body. So, which no one's demonstrated a very simple thing to do like it's a very there's very basic respiratory physiology um to demonstrate that kind of stuff or just hematologists measure the blood and just don't see it happening now the placebo effect is a motherfucker because that really works well yeah so and if it tastes different like i mean chances are that's probably pretty good water i mean that's not saying like it's crappy water they've they filtered it you know free of heavy metals you know, it's obvious there's no bacteria in that, so it's it's clean water. Yeah. And you can taste, like, I drank some really good water back in the day. There was, um, oh, there was an aquifer somewhere, and they you can't get it anymore. For some reason, it got shut down. I think the, 
I think the the man, the uh, big government somehow was involved with it. I can't remember what this what the, the story was, but this water was really really good and it tasted awesome. Okay, just tasted so good and like I was still aware that like you know I'm not like majorly changing the pH of my body. You know that's something that's gonna gonna happen. You know as a function more so of your diet and just your general health status. Yeah. Um, your ventilation, blah blah blah, but man, that water tasted good. I like there's a Trader Joe's water that's a pH water. Mm-hmm. I buy that, but I, it's not because I think I'm going to fix something. I just like the taste of it. It's my favorite water there is out there. Yeah, it's, I mean, the electrolytes in there, and, and that's smart too. Our yeah. bodies do have sort of a you know a wisdom about them. We have to be careful, like. All this artificial sweeteners taste fucking awesome too. You know? Yeah, yeah. Doritos taste really good, but they're not good for you. Right, right. But um, but I think you know we can trust a little bit in water, you know, in organic and clean food and water sources that our body's telling us whether you know something that's good for us or not. But yeah, yeah. I was drinking a lot of pop uh, for a long time, and I've all but cut it out now. Like this last week, I was traveling and I had more soda uh, that I had in a while. But outside of that, I've gone weeks at a time with not having any. Unless I went out to a restaurant or something, I might have a glass. But I could see a difference in my skin, and yeah. I, I've had people notice that too. That I, my, I just that I look healthier just in general. So, like I said, this last week I drank more soda that, and, and I noticed now too when I did drink more, it didn't make me feel good. Like I much, I I realized like I much would have rather had water, more water. Um, mm-hmm. But I could see it. You know, my pee looks better. It looks clear. Right. You know, right. <laughs> you feel right. healthier in general. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, and it's because you know what, I was dieting and I drank a lot more soda because there's the Coke Zero and like you mentioned, like the orange soda. I bet the grape is amazing. A um, and W root beer, all those things. It's like having a dessert, yeah. a calorie free dessert, oh, yeah. basically. You know, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and and I've been having more water now, actually, too. Just kind of for that reason, I've actually craved the water. I've got. Whether it's you know, it's in my on my head, or there's actually something in my body that's informing me yeah. that I should have more water. But I have a purification system here at my house. It's okay, a pretty decent one. Nice. So, how yeah. is the water in Florida overall? Tampa's water is awful. We have ter- horrible water quality. Okay. okay, everything I've read and heard, and like there was even a person I talked to once. I feel really bad for. Her. I think she may have been a bit overblown in terms of of the shame that she felt, but, but she, um, one of her dogs got cancer. Oh, she was God. a vet tech and she was really super like more. I mean, I'm a super dog lover, but there's some people just over the top mm-hmm. and they almost to the point where they, they, they hate everyone who doesn't like dogs. Like <laughs> there's like an animosity towards non dog people and just even people in general. And I think she was sort of, she sort of tended towards that camp and her dog had gotten cancer and she had intended to have gotten a purification system for the water here. Mm. And she said, she says she swears that it was her fault. Mm. That her dog, because she think it was from the water. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, it's, it's funny. Like I put the purified water in my dog's bowls. Um, we got two bowls in the house, one in the kitchen, one in the back of the house where the bedroom is. And, they still love to drink that shitty water that's like in the line on the side of the street. Yeah, or in the toilet if you leave it open. You know? <laughs> I don't do that. I, I, I've kept them from that. But Blitzy, she drinks the pool water as much as she oh, possibly god. can. Oh, God. Oh, God. I know. I'm like, the only thing I can think of I mean, is that, you know, water is a source of minerals, you know, to some degree in a natural natural setting. And maybe maybe I should have my water tested and see if maybe I'm, um, however the, the purifier is working, maybe it's taking too many minerals out yeah and they're see- they're seeking out you know like animals do a better job of than we do yeah to try to like fulfill their diet with uh what's lacking yeah but like we'll go on walks it's like it's hot i know but like i'm kind of like yeah, what do you that is just the nastiest water i could possibly <laughs> imagine finding that's been sitting there for a week that is there's always water right there and there's motor oil in there right and there's gravel and there's pesticides that have come down from that person's yard it's just like the worst fucking shit you could possibly get right and they love it they're just lapping it up i'm like we have water three minutes <laughs> like that so 
anyway. We have, you know, as we were talking about before we started, guys, over at the uh, the new um, Advices Radio page that we have, it's a group on Facebook, uh, we started a new question thread yesterday. Um, I had gotten a question on direct message over at Instagram, and I said, hey, were you aware, you know, we're taking questions, but we didn't have a thread yet for Muscle Minds. So we put up a thread for Muscle Minds, we instantly got some great feedback, we got a lot of questions over there, um, and I had, I had one other one. Now, I know, Scott, you said that the, the answer to this one is pretty easy, but you said at the same time, it's something that, that we could continue to go on and like we could take it forever. Mm-hmm. I'd be curious to hear what you have to say, because it's something that I've dealt with before. Um, he says, uh, let's see, what is it here? Um, he, he had written me personally about using intra-workout carbs, and we were discussing uh, the highly branched cyclic dextrin that... Uh, um, let's see. Hold on, just a second. Somebody just said, uh, asked if we could get a link. Sure, I'll uh, I'll paste that link in here in just a few. Um, but uh, we had been talking about the highly branched cyclic dextrin that they have over at True Nutrition. He had just ordered some, and he said, I actually tried HBCD with Pepto Pro in my early twenties a couple times. I'm not sure how old he is now. He says, uh, but both times that I tried it, I would go hypo by the end of my workout. Um, I posted in the old message boards trying to see if it happened to other people before or if it's or if it's a possibility. No one really had an answer back then. Um, So he's he's concerned he's going to try it again. uh, And he's wondering, you know, what what was what was going on there during this situation? And while you start to talk about that, I'll grab that 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 uh, that uh, link. Yeah, and I think is the advices group closed? It's a closed it's, group, not open to public. Good point. Yeah, it's a closed group. So the only people who can see any of the questions are people that are specifically, you know, seeking out advices radio and think big body build media stuff. So if you we have the page, which is the public just advices radio page where we just post the shows, but in the group, you know, you can post whatever you want and it's private. So nobody's just gonna randomly type something into Google and then stumble upon it, you know? So it is, you know, you, you know, I'm accepting anybody who wants to join, but it's not something that the general public is going to find. Do we, would we want to do that? I mean, that's what kind of occurred to me is like to get as many people over there, make it. Well, the, one of the guys who just uh, joined and asked a question said, initially I didn't want to do anything like that because it was public. Uh, oh, okay. You know, because some people are asking sensitive questions they have their names attached to it. So a private group is probably a better idea. That way, you know, if I get on there and I'm like, hey, Dr. Scott, how how do you suggest I run three grams of test in my next cycle, you know, uh, with five other steroids? I don't have to worry about my employer discovering that I'm asking that question, you know? Yeah, uh, I mean, if it were a message board where you can, you know, call yourself Big Arms 97. Right. <laughs> hide behind that. And then, but it's Facebook, like... I'd be big calves, seventy-seven. I, 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 yeah, where they go, you know, jumbo calves. I I just wouldn't. I mean, even in a closed group, just for anyone, this is my thought. I would not. Um, I would not consider that this is like a confidential, closed, secret group, so to speak. Sure, sure. It, it, a little, little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a little bit little more, bit. you know, protection there. Uh, at the same time, absolutely. You know, it's. Uh, yeah. You know, it, somebody would have to seek it out if somebody were trying to to get into it. Somebody would have to seek it out. That's for sure. I don't think right. that your employer is going to you know find out that you're involved in that group and then add themselves to that group. You know that type of thing. So people have probably forgotten what the question was, but basically the idea is this person um, way back when in his early twenties, which could have been just a couple of years ago or could have been decades ago. Um, it couldn't have been that long ago, actually. He was using highly branched cyclic dextrins and Pepto Pro and creating a scenario where he was getting hypo during his workout. So, <clears throat> so what normally happens? So, so intra workout nutrition is is um, to use sort of a more uh, modern term. It's a, it's a biohack essentially. <clears throat> what happens normally when you're exercising when you wouldn't be eating? It's kind of an odd scenario that you're actually taking in calories um while you're exercising and you know and especially in the, the in those forms because both highly branched cyclic dextrins and pepto pro hydrolyzed um, casein those are engineered basically bioengineered pseudo foods hmm. um purposely made for increased absorption um 
uh, to sort of move quickly through the gastric emptying process and to bypass the normal uh, hydrolysis of the, of the peptide. So digestion and absorption is enhanced in both of those cases. Because normally when you're exercising, you've got your sympathetic drive um, going, and that is actually antagonistic to gastric emptying and digestion. So it, that's the fight or flight arm of your autonomic nervous system as opposed to the rest, repose, and rest and digest, sometimes people say, when it comes to the, uh, the parasympathetic nervous system. <clears throat> so normally when, when you're exercising and you're, you're limiting digestion, you really don't have any, that's not really the primary concern. The primary concern is to get the prey, to escape, to do whatever it is that requires you to be exercising w with such intensity. Um, and make use of muscle glycogen and fat, free fatty acids and intramuscular triglycerides, but mainly the higher the intensity, more glycogen. Um, and part of how um, the body regulates fuel use during that time is that sympathetic drive actually goes to the pancreas in particular, and insulin levels go down. When you take an interworkout, insulin levels go up. And the insulin levels normally go down to balance out the fact that when you're exercising, there is an increase in insulin sensitivity in skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscle, let's say, you know, you have a resting insulin sensitivity of one. It may go up several fold um, in terms of glucose uptake. Well, we don't want more insulin around being delivered to that skeletal muscle now at a higher rate because you've increased blood flow several fold to the skeletal muscle during exercise. So we reduce the insulin and make sure we don't end up becoming hypo in the first place. Yeah. Um, cause the brain prefers glucose. It can use ketones as well, but brain or blood glucose level is only very small, like five grams of glucose in your entire bloodstream. Hmm. So there's a very small amount that needs to be sort of managed there to maintain euglycemia. Um, and you may actually get a, a little bit of hyperglycemia, too. So that same sympathetic drive that inhibits insulin secretion so we don't have all this extra insulin or, or even regular insulin levels being delivered to the skeletal muscle, which would cause that glucose to be taken up and promote hypoglycemia, which the brain's not going to like. When that's going on, we're also stimulating glycogenolysis in the liver, to free up glucose and mm. provide glucose. And that's all being coordinated to maintain euglycemia. So <clears throat> now we introduce an intra-workout, um, and as kind of a special one cause, because the highly branched cyclic dextrins are rapidly absorbed. Um, there's not a whole lot of research really on, and there's there's like two forms of targa that have been tested, and those studies actually found different things in terms of insulin and glucose elevation hmm. um, because in one of them they used a barley and the other one they used a potato-based carbohydrate starting material. Vitargo, if you look it up, actually, um, it's kind of funny. If you look up Vitargo, the patent is just on the process that's used to boil down a certain starting material huh. and create the high molecular weight carbohydrate. And you can start with barley and potato and maybe one or two other grains, but those were two. So they changed they changed their starting material at some point in time hmm. in the product that now is Vitargo, and I think that's why they call the one Vitargo S2 or something like that. Okay. And they have two studies. This is actually covered in my book. I've written about it on John Meadow's site a few times, but um, it's oh, so confusing because they, they did one with barley and they did one with potato, and in one of them um, they found greater glycogen um, uh, Fat, more rapid glycogen replenishment, and I'll the other damned. one they, they found greater ele insulin elevation, but they didn't find the, um, those findings in the other studies. So they took wow. the best of the two studies, and they claim make the du dual claims for their current product, which is not supported by the research because the research was on their current product, yeah, one starting material, and some of the research was on another starting material. That's bullshit. It, it's both Vitargo because Vitargo is like. You could fucking take like gravel and then you know, expose it to the Vitargo, you know, pH and cooking process, and it's Vitargo. Yeah, that's just the patented thing. Like, 
It'd be like, you know, I have a patented way to flatten stuff. I hit it with my right hand really, really hard. And I <laughs> right. say abracadabra. And now that's an abracadabra flattened thing. And it could be like a piece of Play-Doh or it could piece of, be a piece of poop. Yeah. Or it could be a bagel. And that's it's still the an abracadabra flattened thing because I patented it. It's still Vitargo. It's, well, it's whatever. Hmm. But Flatigo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's going to taste really different whether it's a bagel or a piece of poop. Yeah, yeah. So, and anyway, digest differently, too. Yeah. Uh, yes, there's a lot of differences. So anyway, um, but highly branched cyclodextrins, those, that's actually kind of a crapshoot too, um, hmm. because um, I've looked looked into this and the extent the uh, average molecular weight can vary depending on where you get those from. Yeah. And so anyway, so that's one piece of the puzzle. The other piece of the puzzle, the Pepto Pro, and that's a more standardized one. Um, and there you've got these amino a- you've got amino acids and di and tripeptides that are coming in really rapidly. So you've got now a situation where you've elevated blood glucose, in which is going to cause um, an elevation of insulin, which, which is not normally what happens. And you've got an increase in amino acids and some of these di and tripeptides, which have insulin secretagogue actions, some of them. And at least in r- rat studies, it was rodent, was a mice or rat? I can't remember. It was some Chinese group or sorry, a Japanese group. And they actually can insulin sensitize skeletal muscle. Yeah. And they, at least rodent skeletal muscle, um, irrespective of, of an effect on insulin. Hmm. So now we have elevation in glucose, elevation in insulin from the from the peptides and the amino acids, and a further insulin sensitizing effect hmm. during exercise. Well, guess what? More insulin and greater insulin sensitivity, if that's not balanced by increasing blood glucose appropriately, then you get too much of that insulin and insulin sensitivity, you get hypoglycemia. Sure. That's how it happens. So he, what he may have been doing back in his 20s when he was doing this is getting basically a reactive hypoglycemia. So he might drink his drink get an insulin spike, and you can have a psychogenic one as well. Literally where, oh, that tastes so good. Like if it was his first meal of the day, mm-hmm. and, his insul- and, and he didn't have a whole lot of glucose reserves in the, in the liver to replenish blood glucose if it started to go down. So he had, maybe he's fasted you know, for a while, and this is his first food, and it tastes really good because it's sweet and tasty. I mean, he gets this nice insulin surge, yeah. and it's only like 20 grams of glucose, and he exercises really hard and long. He finishes that off in the first half an hour. The the incoming glucose has come in and come out because he only took in 20 grams and it was rapidly absorbed. But now he's got insulin sensitivity and maybe elevated insulin levels that last much longer than that. Insulin sensitivity can last five, six, seven, eight hours. Yeah. Even even beyond when the insulin levels have come back down to baseline. Hmm. So he's got the, the protein and the elevated insulin from the drink. And the fact that the exercise is increasing insulin sensitivity, driving more glucose into those skeletal muscle cells, um, just in and of itself, and you're delivering more blood to that muscle, which is going to foster that same glucose uptake at the same time. And you've got a recipe for a reactive hypoglycemia, where he gets a a little bit of a hyperglycemia from the drink, and then he gets hypo. Mm. Because he's not continually feeding in any glucose okay. during the workout, so there are two things that people do to counteract that. I, the simplest one, this is the one that I I always do, is if you've got a drink and just spread your drink out over the course of your of your workout. If you're going to train for ninety minutes, you know, don't drink it all in the first ten minutes, right? Because because then it's like, especially if you're training legs or something like that, you probably will get a reactive hypoglycemia. It's very possible. If you're dieted down, you're actually insulin sensitive, et cetera, et cetera, and you haven't eaten anything, so your liver is um, is basically devoid, bereft of glycogen. Um, and the other thing that like John Meadows likes to do, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, he likes to like have like a pre- little bit of a pre workout meal with like some almond butter or a fat source to slow it down a little bit. That, well, that will slow it down. So it's another way to meter it out. Yeah. You know? um, I just find it's easier like just match, just drink it you know, as you're going along. Yeah, that makes sense. Because yeah. I had experienced that before, and I found that I felt more balanced if I added um, dextrose to my shake. 
Mm. And, and, and I'm sure that that's, that's probably why, is that I'm giving myself more glucose then to feed that insulin spike. It'll give you a good insulin spike, but it's not. it won't leave the stomach as quickly. So that dextrose will bloat you. So this comes down to the, the idea of the um, osmolality of the carbohydrate source. So a high molecular weight carbohydrate source basically means that if you're looking at um, what is the equivalent of, it's a, let's say it's 20 grams of carbs. I'll just kind of keep it, keep it simple. If you've got a high molecular weight carbohydrate source, you might have, um, I'll just, this is a random number, you might, you might have a thousand molecules in there. Okay. And that's a little, that would make them bigger than they actually are, but let's say you've got a thousand molecules. So what um, largely determines how rapidly um, the glucose moves from your stomach and into your small intestine and then can be absorbed where, where it's absorbed into the, most of it's absorbed into the bloodstream is the number of particles in the, in the carbohydrate source. Hmm. Um, so if it's a high molecular weight, it means you've got hundreds, thousands of glucose all strung together to make one particle. So you're going to have, you only, tr you only have to feed a, a thousand of those um, particles into the small intestine. Whereas if it's glucose, every single glucose muscle, every single glucose molecule is one unit, one particle, one molecule in there so you've got many many more and that's going to pull a lot of water into your gut i see especially i see yeah and that's going to create bloating there's some physiology involved there so this is why the high molecular weight idea is you know is thought to be such a good one and why some people do really well is because you have faster gastric emptying that's what they see with the highly brand cyclic dextrins and tends to be the case with vitargo you can just take in lots of carbs it moves freely real quickly you take in gluco or dextrose you still will get a pretty high glycemic index, but it, it's not going to leave your stomach that. So it's, it basically will end up being sort of a slower carbohydrate hmm, okay. in that sense during exercise. Okay, interesting. So that's pr probably a large part of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I just would add so, a small amount to my shake, and I found that that corrected it. Not knowing the science behind it, not understanding yeah. what was actually happening, I was mm -hmm. like, oh, this, this seems to work better for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it, you know, it wasn't enough where I'd get bloated. I mean, back in the day, we used to use a lot more. I remember, I remember doing just maltodextrin or dextrose were my only options, mixing that yeah. with water and then adding branch chains because that's all that we had, you know, years yeah. and years ago. That was the thought was like, you just do that. That's the Milos yeah. uh, shake. <laughs> yeah, not bad. I mean, you want, you want obviously all the essential amino acids. We know that much at least. Now, right, but right. Still, yeah. Yeah. Like when people, it's funny because... You will adjust to the glucose or the maltodextrin. Like mm. you were able to, I did that too. I, I could tell the difference between glucose and maltod. I remember when I was switched to maltodextrin. Mm -hmm. I was just buying glucose from like, um, oh, a True Nutrition had it or True Protein had it, and then there was the Protein Factory, and sometimes they get it from like these um, beer brewing places too. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember you had the tub. You had the big tub. Oh, that, that, that was whey concentrated. Oh, that was right whey. Here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But it was back in that era, you know. So I would have whey concentrated and glucose. Yeah. You know, and that was fucking bloat city. But you get used to it to some degree. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, and nowadays, people will take in, like, Pepto Pro and highly brand cyclic dextrin and, um, you know, no, get no bloat. And they're zero. not used to zero bloat. Yeah, which is, you know, really nice. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I wonder, like, there is something, you still get a change in, like, protein synthesis with even using, like, six six grams of amino acids. So it will shift things, just even small hmm. amounts matter. Hmm. But, you know, I, I wonder, um, you know, some people are using, uh, you know, very, very small amounts of that. That wouldn't bloat them whether it was dextrose and protein or highly branched six dextrins and, and Pepto Pro. Mm. So, like, if, if you're literally doing, like, like 20 grams of carbs and, like, you know, let's say it's 10 grams of essential amino acids or 10 grams of Pepto Pro, and, like, you just switch that out for 20 grams of dextrose, yeah. glucose, and 10 grams of whey isolate, would you really notice, as far as your GI and what have you, probably not. Would it make that big of a difference? It's such a small amount, like that's that's only 120 ca calories. Right. <laughs> it's not that much, like in the grand scheme of things. 
but you're paying a shitload more for the highly rancid connections of the Pepto Pro. Yeah, you are for sure. Yeah. So I think the advantage, the point I'm getting is I think the advantage is if you're really pushing the intra workout Mm -hmm. and you're someone who's like, who's jacking up the calories because they've reached that point in their off season where they really need to try to fit in as much as they can. And they're like, you know, they're leveraging an intra workout, like right in between two meals, Mm -hmm. fit in the most calories during their waking hours as possible. That's when it's going to be more important, I think at least, and helpful to use sort of the um, the designer carbohydrate and protein sources. Mm, yeah. Um, because it's just 120 calories. It's just, you know, it's not th- not that it wouldn't be potentially helpful. I think there's prob- there's some definitely some possible utility there. But, you know, you're probably paying more. You don't, you don't need, like, a Lamborghini to get down to the corner grocery store to pick up some milk and eggs. Right. Yeah, I um, found Carbo Load, which is a much cheaper carb that I got from True Nutrition. That seems right. to work just fine for me, too, you know. Some people get more um, upset stomachs, you know, from from different carbohydrates. So my thought is, as long as you know you tolerate it, then go for it, right? Yeah, yeah. But but the thing is, I think do people you can you can work your way into using the cheaper sources. You'll get used to it. Mm, okay. Yeah. 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 And some people just don't want to have anything in their stomach. They just like being kind of light, light feeling. So sure. But anyway, everyone, you know, something different. <laughs> Hey, how about that message? Uh, I, I well, the it was a thread I tagged you in uh, the other day on Facebook, and I said, "Hey, Scott, what do you what do you think of this?" There was a company they're offering uh, a combo of minoxidil and finasteride uh, to in, in their their advertising on Facebook. I think I've seen them advertising on uh, Instagram now too and they make it look simple it shows this guy who just walks in the bathroom and he takes a little thing squirts it in his hair and then washes the pill back and somebody had commented just some guy who didn't know anything he said hey are there any side effects to this and the company said you know that's a great question we get that question often and you know uh, we put together this informative video to uh, to uh, to help you um, understand this. In fact, I, I wonder if I still have it here. Um, let me see here. I might, yeah. I might what still I have it. Is someone was making note of the post finasteride syndrome was, but was it not in that video? Maybe I clicked on the wrong thing. Well, uh, here's, here's what they said in the, in their response. What are the potential side effects of finasteride? 3.8% of men had sexual side effects but interestingly enough 2.1 percent of men taking placebo had the side effects even after they stopped the placebo as well the side effects can be impotence decreased sex drive decreased semen volume and in almost everyone it is reversible so this is keeps.com that has this now i just did a real simple google search that said uh, finasteride side effects and I found this, uh, it says Medical News Today. Um, there was a study about Propecia um, linked to a side effects of sexual dysfunction, a problem that may not go away after treatment. So I scrolled down and it said, uh, uh, found that 89% of the 54 men met the Arizona Sexual Ex- uh, Experiences Scale of Sexual Dysfunction at rate, uh, which rates sex drive, libido, um, arousal, penile erection, ability to orgasm, and orgasm satisfaction. Um, and then it said, in most men who develop persistent uh, sexual side effects, uh, wait a second, Dis- uh, despite the discontinuation of finasteride, the sexual function continued for many months or years. So of these people... Um, it says, okay, let me back up a little bit. 96% of those who were reassessed still had persistent sexual side effects. 
Um, some of them also had changes in cognition, genital sensation, and ejaculate quality. I just feel like that that's very different than what that video wanted to present. Well, yeah, they said 3.5%. I mean, I, I just found a study here um, uh, published in 2003, Incidence and Severity of Sexual Adverse Experiences in Finasteride, a placebo-treated men with benign prostatic hyperplasia. And that one is over 50%. Mm. Yeah, they said that so. it was like 3 point something percent and versus uh, placebo, like 2 point something percent. So realistically, you are almost as likely to have sexual side effects from the placebo. According to what they said. But According, that's not, exactly. That's, and that's what you you're... Look at them, that's not what the bulk of the literature says. It's higher than that. And what, um, what was that number again that you just read? Uh, let's see here. Read through it. Just looking at the... I'm being an abstract scientist here. Yes. It just irritated me because I know that there's more problems than that. And this poor guy, uh, you know, he just... He just asked a simple question like, oh, well, we've prepared a video for you. And this guy looks, it, if I show you the video here, Scott, maybe I can put this on our uh, our show for the final version. But this, uh -huh. this scientist, this doctor talks, they show his name under it, and then they show a little graph and show a chart and says 3.2 and 2.9%. And then from there, they just cut to this beautiful full head of hair while they talk. And all it just shows is this beautiful full head of hair. This one, so this is funny, because I found this in the um, list of references in another, and they put a note next to it, which doesn't seem to match what I'm reading in the uh, in the abstract. So you got to see, I probably should read this whole study. But basically, they're saying, in, in the one I just uh, read the title to, that during year one of the study, when they were treating um, some patients with finasteride, 15% of the finasteride-treated patients and 7% of placebo-treated patients had sexual adverse effects that were considered drug-related by the investigator. Okay. So there's 15% versus 7%. Yeah. And I tell you what, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, like 15%, like, like one out of six, you know, one out of six, one out of seven chance. But when that happens, that's fucking, that's just diabolical to your life. Like yeah. That's highly destructive to your quality of life, quality yeah. of living. So, um, yeah, it's, and I've had, clients who that happened to you know mm. not in a long while it was it was this was like a decade ago i think when i first came across it and i started looking into it and, and then that was when people were starting to sort of figure this out but okay. there's we still don't know the mechanisms for this it's, it's kind of a, a weird thing like we we're talking about before the show maybe this is uh, some sort of a um epigenetic phenomenon because hmm. it seems to persist after discontinuation of the drug Hmm. Okay. You know, and it's it's an odd it's an odd thing. So you take the five alpha reductase inhibitor, um, and I don't know if if they've looked uh, compared dutasteride with finasteride, which I presume would be you know just as uh, just ha just as bad as finasteride. Dutasteride inhibits both isoforms of the five alpha reductase um, enzyme. Finasteride only one of them, but um, that's why it's called dutasteride, like dual. Mm. Uh, and but so you you're you're limiting dht formation and you know who who knows i wonder what's what's happening in the brain or elsewhere in the body such that just not having some continual stimulation from dht um causes an irreversible change in the functioning of the neurons that are involved with sexual stimulation and sensation and sex drive or what have you like is there it's it's an interesting thing like it's almost as if you can it can it, there needs to be some maintenance level of dht there in place in order to maintain sexual function and if you turn that off you know pharmacologically with a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor yeah you're you know it seems like it stays off you know like you, you like once you close the close the faucet you can't open it back up again um, but the, the mechanisms that um, I ju I'm seeing actually papers here that are like, you know, one's investigation of the plausibility of 5 alpha reductase inhibitor syndrome, hmm. which in 2016. Let me see, I'll open this one up. So it's like, like, why is this happening? What's going on here, you know? Yeah. Um, let's see. 
usually have some uh, epidemiology here. Which I just, I, I can't believe that this company would blazingly just lie like that. that I mean, it, it really is scary, man, because they're really trying to, to dust that under the rug is what it sounds like. And, and it's just to sell more products is what it sounds like to me. Mm hmm. So this. Not to mention it was really expensive. I mean, if you really wanted to go that route, you could go to Walmart and pick up your uh, pick up your minoxidil there for like fifteen dollars a month, and then go on right. a research site and pick up your DHT blocker for you know a several month supply for next you know a lot cheaper than what they were selling it for a lot more like seventy dollars a month or something like that. Mm-hmm. They have a nice table in this in this study. The one about the plausibility of post anasteride post post five alpha reductase yeah inhibitor syndrome. And um, not all the studies show persistent effects. Um, and incidence is, is varied. Just kind of scamming. They have a big table. It's like a two-page table, one-half-page table. Okay. Okay, so here I'm looking at, they've got roughly, just kind of eyeballing it, um, 25 studies here, and it looks like about half of them show um note in the column persistent effects yes okay so not all of those have control groups um but yeah there's uh like here's one like this like this is just terrible um chiriaco et al 40 number 45 here so like this the side effects um and it's some of this is a matter of like, are, are you creating an expectancy in people? Like, are, are when you ask, you know, especially in this in this context, and, it's, and this may be a function of of um, when that study was done. So let me look at this. I'm just sort of curious. This is the kind of shit that I do when I dig into studies. Is I look around and ask questions. So this study was published in 2016. So as some background information, one of the things. Um, related to placebo effect that that has been noted over the course of the past several decades is that antidepressants when they study antidepressants the placebos seem to be working better and better over time i'll be damned wow and the the thought there is that um because now more and more people recognize that drugs can be used to treat depression yeah there is an expectancy that if they're given something to treat depression, that they're going to have less depression. Yeah. That's what the placebo effect is all about. That's crazy. So, so this particular study, and it, I'm just, I'm just sort of, this is the first thing popped in my head. It's at the bottom of this table in this, in this study. Um, I can send you a, a link to it or if you want to post it. Sure. It's a uh, Fertig is the last name. Okay. The first author investigation of the plausibility of five alpha reductase inhibitor syndrome this was published in 2016 so a paper in their table um, of all the studies they examined actually also published in that year found um, side effects in the in the finasteride group loss of penile sensitivity or penis sensitivity 87.3 percent decreased penile temperature 78.5 percent penile flat flaccidity wrinkling 68 percent loss of scrotum sensitivity 62%, 65% experience reduction, penile dimension, and loss of body muscle tone and mass, 51.9%. So I have to go and see how they measure those, those if that was subjective or not. But it was an observ observational retrospective study. So it wasn't a high-quality study, but it's interesting. So now people are coming to expect the possibility of these things. Yeah, yeah. Or, or if you just ask them, we're going to ask you about, like, you know, sexual side effects, and maybe they tell them when they're literally going into the study, these are the questions we'll be asking. Yeah. Um, people start paying attention to those things. Sure, sure. Yeah, and you, you'll create um, effects in your mind, basically, which is what placebos are all about. <laughs> so it's a, di a difficult thing when you, if you tell individuals what you're, what you're intending to study, then that directs their attention towards those things in Absolutely. a way that it wouldn't otherwise had you not told them to pay attention to that. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, anyway. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, there's there's plenty of evidence out there that it could be higher than that. So they they, they may have cherry picked a study. That's what it sounds like. They found something that looked really good on their behalf. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm looking over here at the questions. I'm not sure, um, you know, if there's anything in particular you wanted to tackle. Did you get a chance to look at the uh, at the thread at all, Scott? I glanced at them. Um, so we we'll just we can burn through these. So Dan Whitfield's asking about growth hormone and looks like reconstituting underground lab injectables. Yes. Um, or oh no, not he was running just purifying. Yeah. Yeah, running it through a 22 micron filter. So he's worried about his first one he's got is would one prefer to take HGH? It's 99 plus percent pure with zero dimers um, or 97 to 98 percent pure with 0.004 percent dimers and dose 50 percent higher per vial. Cost, same for each. Both are also generics from branded reputable source. <clears throat> so, so a dimer is, a monomer is like a growth hormone, a single molecule. A dimer is two of them that have, have uh, cleaved the, together. Um, some uh, hydrophobic and electrical electrostatic forces. They're just stuck together. To, so you get, that'll happen. Growth hormone will just stick, like two of them will kind of buddy up and you get some small percentage of growth hormone that's, that's dimerized. Yeah. Which may actually still even be active from what I've read. So the issue that I think he's getting at is is the possibility of antigenicity is that you might have and your immune system might react to those dimers in a way that um, makes it such that you no longer get an effect mm. from the from the growth hormone. You inject it, you get antibodies that, that are made to match that growth hormone molecule that you've gotten with your this underground source, and now you don't get um, an effect of the growth hormone because your immune system sees it as a foreign molecule. Hmm. So... So the di- whether the dimers are horrible or terrible, I, I don't know how bad they are. One says 0% dimers, zero dimers, what he wrote, and 0.004% dimer. So there's also, like, I don't know I don't know how, what the precision of measuring percent dimers are mm-hmm. um, it, in the different way, in the, in, for, in the techniques that were used to do this, or whether it was measured at the same lab or what have you. I have a, since I might know what he's what lab and what products he's talking about, but zero and point zero zero four percent is very 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 small difference, and it may be that just <laughs> as it turned out, like the 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 um, instrument gave a point zero zero four percent reading, mm-hmm. and its precision and um, accuracy is such that you know that could have easily been point one percent or one percent. Mm. Okay. Um, so I don't know, but point zero zero four percent and zero percent are very very close. Yeah. So I would be more concerned about the second one because it's ninety seven in terms of autogenicity and producing antibodies, um, or antigenicity. Sorry, ninety seven to ninety eight percent pure. So what's that like? Why is there a range there? And what's that like two to three percent made of? Hmm. Are those those fragments? Are those fragments that produce an immunoreaction? Hmm. Uh, and it's dosed at fifty percent higher per vial, so it's you know fifteen IU's per vial. So you're getting more GH for the same price. Yeah. Here's the thing: is that depending on your particular isoform of the growth hormone binding protein, which is from the same gene as the growth hormone receptor, and how well those particular growth hormone products activate your growth hormone receptor. You might find hmm. that one of those products is, works really, really well for you, and the other one not so much. Hmm. Even though, like one's pure, like the one that's dosed fifty percent higher, just may not be very bioactive for him. And it's kind of a, a potluck, kind hmm. of a pot. It's you don't know whether you're going to have an, an antigen reaction to the growth hormone or not. It happens in some studies in some percentage, which varies. It's usually in where they're studying like dwarfs okay. kids, you know, to see if they produce antibodies to growth hormone when they get treated with it to, to pr- increase their height. And um, but you don't know whether you're going to. You may be a lucky one, you may not be. And this is where they're using like everyone's getting humotrope or whatever. They're, they're using like the same, the same lot, you know, the same factory, farm grade, legit research grade stuff right and some people 
get antibodies, some people don't. So it's really hard to know, to be honest. Um, if you're, if like, let's say, you, if you think of it, like, I'm, if you're someone who's like, you know, the last thing I want to do is get antibodies, I just have a feeling I will, I've got, I don't know, I've got some sort of, uh, you know, I have a tendency to have lots of allergies in my family, and I do, and, you know, it just seems to be really, um, have multiple chemical sensitivities, um, then the 99% pure one might be a better better choice to avoid that. It could also be that those growth hormone molecules, because of how they're produced, and um, may not work for shit for him as yeah, well. Yeah. So he might be able to get a much better, more bang for his buck in terms of growth hormone effectiveness with the other one if, and then not have any antibodies produced, but he'd have to have that measured. He'd have to get that tested himself. Yeah. So it's a good question, but... Um, yeah, the dimers aren't the thing that I'd be concerned about. I think it is a, an indirect measure of quality. If like you've got a whole bunch of like, if you, if you were like fifty percent dimers, mm -hmm. that's way higher than what you typically find in, when it comes to looking at the profile of endogenous growth hormone molecules in the blood. Mm -hmm. It's not not fifty percent. I've seen different numbers, but I think you know less than ten percent. But you have some percentage that are normally dimers. Okay, and, and that's a normal thing to have. Yeah, but the difference between zero and point zero zero four percent, I think, is probably inconsequential. Okay, I wasn't sure, honestly. I yeah, didn't. I didn't have an idea. I didn't know if it was. I mean, it sounds like it's a small difference, but I, it's like, hell, I don't know. So, the second one's another kind of a chemistry question. I'm going to just take a shot at it, but this is my best guess. And and just to reiterate, he was saying, uh, you know, if you run a gear, uh, oh, yeah. UGL gear through a twenty two filter. Would that in, uh, filter out any uh, heart, heavy metal impurities? So the, a 22 micron filter, that's pretty small, but um, that, that's going to get rid of like bacteria, maybe some, ideally some viruses, hmm. um, you know, biological material and, you know, like obviously like rubber that came off the stopper and that kind of shit. Like, yeah, just, but um Heavy metals themselves are much, much smaller than that. And as far as I, I know, the only way you're going to get rid of those is going to have to have precipitated them out hmm. in some way, shape, or form. The same way they do when they purify water. Really? Gonna have, there's going to have to be some chemical, um, probably change in pH and create some uh, conjugate with those heavy metals hmm. in a way that precipitates them out. Interesting. Yeah, so the filter won't do that. I mean, like a... Um, so a 22 micron filter, just to give you like a scale, um, the diameter of a red blood cell is eight microns. Okay. So if you're looking at those pore sizes, I think the 22 is as diameter, um, and that's the that's the finer of the two ones you generally will find. Like a that's just like a syringe filter. Mm. Um, you could you could almost get line three red blood cells up across there and they could they could go through like mm. hand to hand so to speak you know no two of them, other one piggyback so um hmm. so you're not i mean you wouldn't filter those things out you're just getting rid of like big stuff like big ass like bacteria and and those sorts of things with a micron filter that's it's not everything that's okay. why people will, will heat their gear and try to, to try to destroy you know basically bake it and sterilize it mm. um, that's you know the typical procedure is bake and then filter Okay. But um so then you then you think, okay, so there's how many molecules are in a red blood cell? Thousands and thousands and thousands. And now if you look at like just one molecule of like arsenic or something like that, um much, 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 much smaller. Okay. Than the size of that filter. So it's gonna go right through. Yeah. Unless you unless you come up with some way to get it to separate. Um that would require a chemical treatment. So um but the other thing is like, I mean, gosh, like where how much like how much how much oil are you injecting that you have to worry about the heavy metal content of the oil like when where is that oil coming from hmm. oh i guess that could be a problem but you know ideally like how fucking hard is it to get like sterile oils you yeah, know you're, yeah. like that should be like a, a gigantic concern if that's a concern then <laughs> i wouldn't i'd just stay the hell away from that because there's something fucked up if you got if you got a heavy metal issue with with oils because the, the, those starting materials aren't that expensive to get, you know, that are high quality. Yeah. I, I know that they were saying like a lot of it is uh, impure, <coughs> impurities from the powders from China. You know, Dave Crossland, yeah, yeah. 
Dave Crossland did that video, uh, you know, under construction and under construction too, and he was running, you know, massive amounts of gear in the second film, and that was one of the things he wasn't expecting. You know, they tested him. He had aluminum and two other. I can't remember which they were. It might have been mercury. Might have been one of them. But he had three different uh, heavy metals that were at very high concentrations in his blood. It took him a long time to get that uh, yeah. to get that straightened out. Yeah, I mean. That's that, that's true. That could come from the powders too, man. And coming straight from China, who knows what they're doing and what kind of facilities they're creating that stuff in? Yeah, I'd have to like like I said, this is those my kind of my best guess. You have to defer yeah. to a chemist mm. to try to figure out how to do that. That's like um, because once you you know once it's in the powder, I think the only way you're able to get it out would have to be to get it into solution in some way, okay. and then add something to it to precipitate it out. Okay. Or, or run it through some distillation process like you would um like water yeah you know and something that has like a electrical charge to it hmm. not that's just a physical filter you want something that's going to pull charged particles oh. off the side or 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 um conjugate them in some way with something that will that will precipitate out of solution so then you have all the solution in this case oil or I mean, you probably may even have to just do it with water, and then you have all the precipitated heavy metals, and then you just, you know, you aliquot off, you take off all the um, the stuff that that's not precipitated out, and that's the pure stuff. Hmm. Or your fil- or your electrical filter would have pulled all of it out, you know, and then you just throw that away because that's got all the heavy metal in it. But that sounds complicated too for like your average guy. It's not just throwing a filter yeah, on, you know? Yeah, like that should happen before you get the powder. Yeah. You know, yeah. they should do that somehow. But I don't know that much about it. That would be great if there's a, it's got to be a physical chemist out there somewhere, someone who's, you know, connected with that stuff. So yeah, let's see here. Josh Hauserman says, is it is going flat okay when you're cutting? Um, I heard it's fine, but it seems to be more of a mindset problem than a problem for losing fat. So, um, being so that's a like that's it's going to depend on like some people like the guy in the picture like at the start of that thread dave i've only seen him flat one time mm, okay just one time and that's when we pushed him really hard and it was when he had did not win a 212 show that um was kind of controversial mm. and he was fired up and, and we're mm. like we're gonna bring you in just freaky yeah and we yeah. pushed really hard and during the peak week he came in like it was the day, you know, we we're going to start the carb up. And I'm like, okay, Dave, you're actually a little bit flat for the first time I've ever seen you flat, which how, was just how, kind of weird. How easy was it to pull him back from that? Oh, but no problem. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, he's still got so much muscle mass and it's just so round naturally. But um, so that's, you know, that's going to depend on, on the person and, and, and how God, there's so many factors go into that. So here's the, I can start with this. The danger of, of being flat, so to speak, is that you're devoid of muscle glycogen. The cells are smaller. Mm-hmm. So both of those things, a dehydrated cell and a glycogen poor cell, is going to be ten. And talking about muscle cells here, is going to tend to be more catabolic. Yeah, those two things do not behoove holding on to muscle mass. Um, so and having less glycogen when you're flat. You're not going to get a good pump, and you're not going to be able to perform in the gym. So your ability to create the stimulus for keeping the muscle mass is going to be less. Like you're going to start hitting the wall. Like you pick up that weight you would normally get for 10 to 12 reps you did the week before it, or two weeks ago, and now you're really, really flat, and you get six. Mm-hmm. Well, now you've, now you've just you – now you're like four to six reps shy of what you're used to getting. Mm. That, that's not good. You're not, now you're not able to maintain the stimulus – um, the anabolic stimulus that, that comes secondary to the training, um, the exercise to keep the muscle mass. Yeah. So some people, you know, they can be flat like that and they can fill back out. It's not a big deal. If you stay flat for forever, then eventually you're going to probably drop some muscle mass. Mm-hmm. Um, some people have to literally put themselves in a deficit um, in order to, like, you only got so many so many weeks to diet down. Sure. Right? I mean, I guess this is why a lot of natural guys will do like 20 or 30 week diet. Um, so that they can create that deficit that's very, very slight. And they're not trying to create so so much of a deficit such as they end up being end up being terribly flat 
for terribly long, and they can sort of chip away at the skeletal or chip away at the body fat. But let's say you've got eight weeks and you've got you know eight pounds of fat to lose, and you're and you're you've got a lot of you've got metabolic adaptation in terms of metabolism. You've got adaptation in terms of your neat. Your body just is resisting getting lean as lean as you need to be. Um, you may have to be someone who's got a diet so friggin' hard that you're flat for a yeah. long period of time in order to get lean enough. So the thing you can do um, is, you know, you have to play with that. So, you know, carb up once a week. You know, I, I prefer, and I've mentioned this before, like I generally use a low-carb, nutrient-timing-based approach where people are taking in carbs post-workout. Um, and the and the non training days they're eating low carbs, okay. so and I ne- and try not to have people do more than two workouts without some sort of a, sort of a carb up for a given muscle group. Mm-hmm. So don't train like chest on Monday and then Wednesday and then um, ideally you carb up like after Wednesday if you didn't carb up after Monday's workout. Okay. You wouldn't go like Wednesday Friday necessarily and then not carb up until like the next Monday. Okay, that would that would probably be too much if you're doing anything of you know, consequence in terms of training the muscle groups on those days. So mm. uh, you can, you have to, so basically the carb up in a way <clears throat> um, is extra calories. So you're taking a step back in terms of losing body fat, but um, you're keeping yourself full. So you're holding on to muscle mass yeah. in a certain, and you're able to train harder. So um, being flat in of itself is, you know, it's going to happen pretty much. Yeah, it's um, part of, it's part of it, really. I mean, you really can't. Is. I mean, at least for me, maybe not for Dave Henry, but if I'm going to get in shape or anybody that I've worked with, you're you're going to have to go through being flat in order to get that. And especially, like you said, Scott, to get, especially you know, if you don't have 24 weeks to diet, there's going to be periods where, for me, I, the way I always try to explain it is that you're going to be going flat, and then we'll fill you out, and then you go right. flat, and we fill you out. It's it's a constant, you know, back and forth, really. And it's, it's a good thing to see yourself go flat. That means that you're lean enough now that you can tell whether you're flat or full. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So you so when you say, like, I'm flat, if you're, if you're that sensitive to carbs that you can see yourself when you're flat or full, and you're not just, you know, losing it up in your head, like, right. oh, my God, I'm flat, you know. Right. I call them body dysmorphia days. There will be certain days you just go in the gym and, like, there's, like, the mirrors in that gym or just whatever. Like, every time you look at yourself, you look, oh, my God, I'm so small and flat and weak and yeah. I look like shit, yeah. you know? No matter, it just happens. And you just have to laugh and say, okay, I'm flat, whatever. I'm going to stick to the program here. I'm going to get carbs tomorrow. I'm getting carbs after this workout and go. So, yeah. but consistently, chronically flat is probably not good, And and it also is a function of how much muscle you have as to whether you feel like Dave never looks flat. For him, he may have been flat, but he really wasn't wasn't noticeable. Mm-hmm. Um, so the more muscle you have, the less like you're going to see that. So if you're a smaller competitor dieting down for the you know one of the first few times, you're going to, and when you start to get in shape, you're going to look flat. Because yeah. you've never seen your body like that before. Yeah, yeah. You know? And some of it can be literally, it's like, you may think you had more muscle mass than you do. Sure, because you're yeah. used to eating whatever burgers or whatever, uh, always pop tarts. Yeah. And then you're, you're you, every time you train, your skin's just popping, you know, at the seams. And yeah, that might not be happening anymore when you're trying to get in shape on a 15 week diet. Well, yeah. Well, I just mean like that when you're actually getting lean for the first time, you may look at yourself and think I'm flat, when actually you just don't have as much oh, muscle mass yeah. <laughs> as you thought you did. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean too. Is like you're you're in the gym now and you don't have all that shit in your muscles to keep it all puffed right. out you know yeah yeah so but some people hold their fat differently too oh, okay yeah 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 so some people like you know the fat doesn't you know it's sort of um it gives them a big rounder kind of look yeah and other people you know they only start looking like like one thing i've noticed like for my my delt and pecs for me they will there's a period of time and i haven't had like a real kind of growing off season in a while now but they would look small to me during a lot of the off season. Like I need a lot more size there. When I would finally start to diet down, and I could st- start to see the separation of those muscles, yeah, then they look. It looked much bigger. Mm. To me. And for, so for me, the fat that I had did not give those muscles a look of being larger. Yeah, yeah. It made it made them look small until finally I started to diet down. Of course, Car- when I take top out, on, uh, you can actually see the muscles. Yeah. So. 
start carving it up more. Yeah. What's this? Uh, I'm not sure what this Kirkland Warletti uh, has a question here. What's that word? Uh, auto, auto, auto. What is it? Autophagy. What is? I've heard. I don't know what autophagy is. How essential is autophagy for muscle growth uh, in the long term? That, that's. Um, he's been paying attention to um, what's her name. He's big on it. Like a lot of the. Oh, blanking on her name uh, find your fitness what's the woman's name Just oh really, uh, Rhonda patrick yeah yeah she's really big on autophagy and she's talked about that on the joe rogan show so that's like cellular house cleaning basically um self-eating is how if you break it down auto being self and um the phage refers to eat okay um, so basically it's it's the sort of the the cleaning self-cleaning it's a um catabolic processes in muscle that balance anabolic processes we're talking about muscle cells in particular here mm. um and you so you have to clean out there's a constant turnover of proteins you have to clean out the proteins that um that have broken down over time and that are going to be replaced by proteins that are involved in in protein synthesis yeah so um you don't want like they're they're they've done this in in animals and like this sort of this is the best answer I, I think for um to kind of like say that it is absolutely vitally important you you can there you can create there's animal models um knockouts genetic knockouts where they basically can um create a scenario where IGF one excuse me not IGF one mTOR so mammalian um target of rapamycin which is sort of the um, central, there's actually two of them, but one of them is sort of the central complex for turning on protein synthesis and directing anabolism inside cells. So people always compare and contrast mTOR and AMPK. AMPK is the sensor of, of uh, cellular energy status. So AMP gets, AMPK gets turned on when you're exercising. That tends to pr promote catabolic and energy expending types of cellular activity so like a lot of glucose disposal agents not all of them but many of them turn on ampk and increase energy demand okay. and that brings causes the cells to bring in more glucose mTOR is turned on by exercise it's turned on by amino acids um insulin turns on mTOR yeah. and that promotes signaling cascades that promote protein translation and transcription and protein synthesis in general so um like rapamycin is an antibiotic, and um, so antibiotics basically bring a halt to protein synthesis, and they do so in human cells, as it turns out. Rapamycin, this is how they figured out what, um, this is why they named that pro that enzyme complex, mTOR, um, mechanistic target of rapamycin, or mammalian target of rapamycin, call it yeah. different things. Yeah. Um, and it does that in bacteria, so the bacteria don't, they, they can't live without protein synthesis, but it also does the same thing in human cells. So you can you can create, um, oh, there's a particular knockout model where you can basically eliminate um, the gene that uh, puts the brakes on mTOR and have mTOR constantly on. Hmm. And mTOR inhibits autophagy. So mTOR is like really kind of like the overlord of protein synthesis. And when it's wanting, when protein synthesis is on full bore, yeah, it's like it's like it's like this like the Superman of contractors has come onto the job site. And says we're building shit. You guys who are cleaning up the waste materials, get the fuck out. You don't get to do shit. Autophagy, you're off. All right, you're done. We're just building and building and building and building. And when they so when they look at the skeletal muscle in those animals where mTOR is on chronically, it's all fucked up. Hmm. It's it, there's there's it's basically pathologic muscle hmm. um, because you've got to have a balance of synthesis and degradation of the, these cleaning processes where you're getting rid of unwanted proteins so that you can create um, this really kind of highly um, elaborate um, matrix or lattice of contractile proteins that is the myofibrils and everything that makes muscle cells so badass at producing force mm -hmm. you've got actin and myosin in in um perfect register 
um, between the Z lines along the myofibrils, along this long giant muscle cell with the you know the uh, nuclei and the mitochondria in all the right places in order to like make this pretty um, elaborate cell with all the proteins lined up to produce force in one particular direction in a given cell. Um, you can't have a bunch of junk lying around. It'd be like It'd be like, um, you know, like, like when the surgeon, you know, they leave their scissors or they leave like, you know, cloth or something in someone's abdomen after they do surgery. You've heard about those things and people are like, I'm having these abdominal pains. It's like, oh shit, you know, we left the clamps, yeah. you know, in there. Like they do that. Or it would be like if like your mechanic, like tried to rebuild your engine and he left a bunch of screws and washers like that he couldn't figure out where they went. Right. It just, and they're like rattling around in there. Like there's shit in all the cavities in your in your engine it wouldn't be good like it's not going to work the way it's supposed to right right. everything has its place so they find like vacuoles like you look at the cross section of the muscle and normally you'd see just this you know nice distribution of actin and myosin you can stain for those things and instead like a cross section of the skeletal muscle which is basically like a tube or a column you'll see like these like big round like like open space (laughs) like like there's just like nothing there, like like fluid, like intercellular fluid. Yeah. Like like it's this fucked up spot and like it's right in the middle of the contractile protein. It's like, okay, that's not good. Or centrally located nuclei, like all the things that you've seen in seeing pathologic muscle that's that is has not recovered from an injury is what you'll tend to see. They're the same sorts of things. I can't say it's all of them, but you see the same sorts of things. So autophagy is, is super important. Now that's kind of tells answers his question. The the question that he's really getting at is probably, do I need to fast um, to promote autophagy? Because hmm. because fa- basically fasting is going to turn off mTOR. Yeah, right. You've got no protein coming in. You've got nothing of an anabolic nature. Um, I mean, you may train when you're fast, but that doesn't. It's not probably the best way to 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 make gains is to train and then not eat anything for eight hours or what have you. So autophagy will tend to dominate when there's no anabolic stimulus and mTOR is not active. So you're seeing kind of like this yin and yang here with autophagy or and and anabolism with mTOR. Do you need to fast um, to like optimize autophagy and skeletal muscle? And I haven't, you know, there's the people who are doing the time restricted feeding and the intermittent fasting studies. Right. You know? and, Super popular. Think, yeah, yeah, and I don't think I haven't seen anyone. Um, try to make a measurement or look particularly at autophagy it seems like it's kind of more of like a buzzword that people like to throw out it's like mm. yeah but i gotta have autophagy going <laughs> like it's like it sounds cool you know yeah and like like but it's like there's no way to like there's not like an autophagy indicator that you can do when you get a cbc or metabolic profile done when you get your blood work done okay like there's nothing that, you know that i that i know of um that's kind of easy to measure there yeah. but it is important for cellular health without a doubt Hmm. So I think what he's getting at, he didn't say that, but I think what he's getting at is, you know, um, how, you know, does, is fasting something that um, by increasing autophagy and giving it a, a chance to, to take place in a way that we typically wouldn't as bodybuilders because we're constantly eating for anabolism, is that something that might foster growth? Hmm. So from that aspect, I don't know, but it certainly does seem to help a lot of people to like take it like a day off of the massive feeding and give your GI a chance to, to rest. Yeah. Uh, you know, so there's, there's, there's something to say for taking a break off of constantly turning on mTOR. But I wouldn't say that like continually eating the way most bodybuilders do is because you're also training and you also are turning on um, some of the catabolic processes as well with exercise. That's just not the same as these knockout models where mTOR is like chronically on Hmm. that's like that's that that demonstrates sort of the principle that autophagy um if completely eliminated from the cellular repertoire of uh events is not a good thing like you you can end up with a pretty messed up cell if that's the case but that's not what happening by you know heating six meals a day and trying to have a constant flux of of nutrients Hmm. so that's a hard thing to to answer but it's important but um, whether you need to, there's something we can do to enhance that and enhance muscle growth, I don't know. <clears throat> Chances are, you know, you most people, you know, when you're, if you don't force the food, eventually the muscle growth is going to, you're going to, you know, you're going to make your newbie gains and then thereafter you're going to have to fight for it. 
Yeah. And, and fasting is not um, <laughs> conducive to that. Right, right. For most people, except to give your GI a chance and be able to take a step back so you can push harder down the road. So, um, but it's an interesting question. So, cool. Right on. Let's uh, let's wrap up there. We we've got a couple more, but we can save them for next time. Um, Scott, did you train yet today? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what yep. do you think of the Olympia? Oh yeah, we didn't talk about the Olympia. No, we didn't. Not at all. I wish I could go, man. I wish I could go. I wish you could go so too. H- Hottie's doing the um, doing the open. That's, That's what I hear. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that will be kind of he's. I I really like his physique. It's just so. It's the conditioning is just like dead on, and he's just it's real crazy. Yeah, and his his legs are just ridiculous. He'll truly. I mean, he's truly a dark horse. You know, nobody expected this. Well, he's not a dark horse anymore. I think the no. dark horse, is like technically, someone who comes in, like at a, like Ronnie Cullen was a dark horse when he won his first one. Okay. Well, we did, we weren't we weren't planning on this up until the very end here. This isn't yeah. like we haven't been we haven't been waiting for Hottie this whole time. This is right. like this is like a last minute entry. So I I'll yeah. still I'll still give him that one. Uh, yeah. You know, he's a yeah. You know, he, he yeah, semi dark horse, I guess. Just, <laughs> a great horse. Trying to get him in, yeah. Like Ronnie came out of freaking nowhere. Like he was like whatever he placed, like sixteenth the year before or something. Yeah, yeah. Twelfth is out of the top ten, maybe. And then like, in, in, but every, people have been waiting and waiting for 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 Hottie to get in. You know, trying to get his visa and it, like it's been so. I don't know what the term is, but yeah, he's definitely he's. He's going to he's going to upset the apple cart. There like you go. Sean Ray yeah. likes to say he's an apple cart upsetter. <laughs> he is. For sure. Yeah. Yes, it'll be interesting, man. I I'm excited yeah. to go check it out. Um I'm excited to see Brandon, excited to see what Roly <laughs> what Roly does. That that's going to be cool too. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm I'm actually leaving in 2 days. So uh, we'll have this show up as usual. And uh guys, um like I said at the beginning of the show, uh, you know everything for video is going to be over at the Think Big uh, Bodybuilding Media. And that's over there at uh, at YouTube. So we have that tagged here. That's where this show is going to be when it comes out, the video version. Of course, the audio version is going to be over at advicesradio.com. I just got done traveling from my, my week up in Ontario, got home last night. We literally uh, got, got on here. And, uh, and just getting all the podcasts out of the way for these first couple of days of the week, and then I'm I'm fleeing town again, heading mm-hmm. out to Las Vegas with Victoria. So we're we're both excited. She's never been to the Olympia before, so it should be fun. Yeah, where are you guys staying? We have a yeah, we have an Airbnb, uh, and okay. and it's it's uh, it's actually over toward the Fremont area. So, okay. um, so it should be should be interesting. We're staying over there, and uh, and we've got our media passes. So so that should be fun. Oh. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited to go check all that out, see what we can do with that stuff. And we've got a video project planned. So guys, anybody who, because it's going to be out, you know, right before the Olympia, anybody who is going to be there, look for us because I have some questions for you. I want to have you in this video that I'm making. So definitely, if you see me, stop me, say, hey. And if you're up for making a couple minutes of video with me, I would really enjoy that. That'd be fun. Oh, sweet. You going to be watching the live stream, I take it, Scott? Yeah. Um. Dan Solomon's company is doing it this year. Yes, digital media. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So cool. I think it's going to be because they didn't do it last year. I don't think so. I'm, I, I trust it's going to be badass. It's yeah, I just watched. Um, what was it? Arizona, the the Wings of Strength. Oh um, yeah, yeah. I had a client over there, Cara Trebish, and um, uh, and another friend of mine uh, both competed there this last weekend. Digital Media did the uh, live stream for that, and it was smooth, really nice. Because he's got a, a he's got a Wings of Strength deal too. So Dan Solomon's everywhere right now. He's got his hands in everything. All sorts of. I love that. I love seeing that. He's a cool dude. He is a good guy. I'm I'm glad we have him at the sort of the helm. Me too. Of bodybuilding media, you know, it, it's it's nice. It's nice to know like. And I've just talked to him a couple of times and I know people I've interacted with him several times in various ways. And it's just like, good dude, man, yeah. just a good, a good guy. He's solid, loves bodybuilding. And that's just phenomenal. It just gives you like, ah, this is finally someone, who, this is someone we want to have there. We can trust this guy. And he's going to do it right. So I feel yeah. the same way. I definitely yeah. do. Absolutely. 
All right, guys. So, well, for another episode of Muscle Minds with Dr. Scott Stevenson, go over to byobbcoach.com to get Scott's book, Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach. You can also go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Check out our sponsor, uh, True Nutrition. You can use our codes, which are advices, or you can use Advices Oats to get 25% off of their oatmeal blends. Uh, and uh, check out fortitudetraining.net. Check out uh, Scott's training plan over there. Scott Stevenson, as always, it has been a pleasure, my friend. Scott McNally, yes, <laughs> pleasure is mine. Enjoy the Olympia. See Thank you guys. Thanks. <laughs>